about some of the um, the challenges that Ghazali faced. Ghazali, as we've said, was the most brilliant debater of his age. And he was that even as a student of al juwaini even as a kind of a young buck in the court of Nizam al-Mulk, he was acknowledged as the greatest debater of his age. One of the things that is fascinating about Ghazali, forget about his spiritual conversion and all that stuff, even before that, that's fascinating about Ghazali is you find that what he wrote polemic about, what he wrote passionate arguments and defenses of, were the great challenges to faith in his time. There is no work extant that Ghazali wrote on why the Shafi'i school is the best school. And for someone who was a mujtahid of the Shafi'i method, and who loved a good debate, and who loved to be right, it is astonishing that there isn't, you know, al hujjatu Shafi'iya al Hanafiya, written by Ghazali. Where is that work? Where is the work on why the Asharis are better than the Maturidis? No such work. Where are his great works on the intricacies, the, the intricacies of theological debate? No such work. Ghazali always, and this again is something which he was guided by God, he focused his tremendous intellect, his rationality, his brilliant debating style, and his powerful argumentation on the greatest challenges facing Muslims in his time. The greatest challenges to faith in his time. And they were Hellenistic philosophy, Greek philosophy, rationalist theology, and Shiism. Specifically, Ismaili Shiism. The great, if you like inverted commas, the great um, polemical works of Ghazali were al mustadhiriya the famous ones, which was his work against uh, his, 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 uh, his de demolition, and it was a proper intellectual demolition job of Shi the fundamentals of Ismaili Shi'ism. And intellectually, Ismaili Shi'ism never recovered. Intellectually, after Ghazali wrote, he wrote five works against the Ismailis. And after those works, Ismaili Shi'ism intellectually just never recovered. They could not argue with what Ghazali had written. And you'll see it when we, go, when we mention it. But Ghazali had, had said, the Ismailis, and remember they were very, very active da'is. They were out there. They were doing tabliyah. They were out there. All right? And they were very active and they were very persuasive. Okay? And he says, when they read our crit Sunni criticisms, they laugh. They laugh. They say, these people don't even, haven't even grasped what we're saying properly. What they're doing is they're debating straw men. And Ghazali said, they're right. They are, we are debating straw men. And he went and studied Ismaili Shiism. And when he presented al mustadhiriya and he says this in, um, in the Ihya actually, he says, I was criticized. And I was criticized because the first part of al mustadhiriya is such a lucid argument for Ismaili Shiism that have done their job for them. I see that I've, I've, I've laid out their doctrine with their strongest arguments. This is, and he's, and the, Musad, the beginning of the Musad here, I mean, he's got an introduction where he explains what he's doing. He's not like he's saying, you know, you lose the second half of the book in your stuff, you know. But his, 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 his Mustafa Hiriya lays out Ismaili Shiism in such a cogent, such a lucid, and such a persuasive way that you really think, oh, you should become an Ismaili Shia, actually. Then he demolishes the arguments. And what his opponent said to him is, you've done their work for them. And what his reply was, you have to. You cannot effectively refute something unless you refute its strongest manifestation. And this is a really important principle. He did exactly the same thing with philosophy. 
he says in Baghdad, he says, I spent three, I spent two years studying philosophy. Two years studying philosophy. And then one year reflecting on it. One year critically appraising philosophy. And you'll see in the Munqid, he says, he's not like he just studied Ibn Sina or the Muslim, the Arab, you know, transmitters of Greek philosophy. No, 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 no. He studied actual Greek philosophy. He went and he says, he says there were all there were all these guys, you know, you know, Dionysus and or Diogenes and you know who and what and Plotinus. He said they're all just their nonsense. They're just, they're just 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 nonsense. And actually, Aristotle refuted all of them, so I don't need to. He said Aristotle was right about them. He said there are three great Greek philosophers. There is Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. And this is Ghazali's literature literature survey of <laughs> philosophy. Right? There's three great Greek philosophers. There's Socrates, Aristotle, Plato. Okay? All three of these guys were basically muwahideen. They were basically monotheists. But there was kufr in their work. There's kufr in what they said. Aristotle refuted Socrates and Plato, so I don't have to. So I'm just going to focus on Aristotle. Aristotle's, Aristotle's the closest. He's the closest to proper belief. But there's still kufr in what he says. Okay? Then he said, and there's, there's a whole lot of Muslim guys. And all of them are nonsense. They, none of them understand Greek philosophy. Except for two. Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina. And these guys are the bee's knees. These guys are the end boss, end level bosses of philosophy. Yeah? They really know what they're talking about. They have faithfully transmitted Aristotelian doctrine and in some cases improved on it so what does he do he writes three works work number one <coughs> is the Mi'yarul Ilm he says this is to teach you logic because if you don't know logic you can never understand philosophy so here is the explanation of the terms they use what those terms mean how we use those terms then he wrote a word called Maqasid al falasifa Maqasid al falasifa he says, I'm just going to lay out here what philosophers believe. That's all. Nothing else. Just what philosophers believe. The third work, at tahafut al falasifa the incoherence, the logical inconsistencies of the philosophers. And that work, I'm going to critique philosophy. And when we, start, when we look at the, the munqid, we will look at how this ties into what we now call educational theory, learning theory. That Ghazali first mastered philosophy. Then he was in a position to properly critique it. Now how was he able to do all of this? How come he did not drown in the same seas that Ibn Sina drowned in? The same seas that Farabi drowned in? The same seas that the, the, the Ismailis drowned in? Or the, the Mu'tazilis drowned in? Do you know why? Because he was already absolutely solidly grounded in theology and in fiqh he was already a mujaddid already a mujtahid in shafi'i fiqh already the greatest usuli that had ever lived already the i mean he was he never, never particularly fussed about theology like, like proper theology i mean like proper theology when i say dialectic scholastic theology he was never particularly fussed about it but he studied with the greatest proponent of, 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 of a sort of if you like, intellectual theology, probably that had ever lived, was Joini. So he was, he was, because he was so solidly grounded, because his ship was, was so you know, waterproof, effectively, he could sail on those seas and not sink. So he writes the Maqasid. The Maqasid, he's criticized. What? What is this? You've laid out the doctrine of the philosophers better than Ibn Sina laid it out. And Ibn Sina was, you know, uh, what was he called? Um, a Sheikh al Rais, the great Sheikh of, of Muslim philosophy. He was the great scholar of Muslim philosophy. Of, of philosophy. He was the one who Islamicized philosophy. Yeah, and he said, you've, you've laid it out better than he laid it out. What are you playing at? That's how he said, read the Tahafut. But first you have to lay out that doctrine in a way that is solid and clearly defined so that 
you, that nobody who reads that work can say, oh, this Muslim Molvi Saab didn't understand what he was talking about. And he just refuted some nonsense, you know, not to, you know, not, not, not to put too fine a point in it, but to Harun Yahya it. You, know, you fundamentally don't understand evolution, and yet you're trying to refute it. It don't work like that. Because, you know, Harun Yahya, God bless him, and, you know, because Muslims don't understand, he, he's, he's really influential and very useful because Muslims don't know biology, basically. You know, we just rubbish at biology and science. And because we rubbish at biology and science, what Aaron Yahya says makes a lot of sense. But actually, if you know something about biology, it doesn't make any sense at all. That's why when you, you don't, you know, someone told me once, I want to call, and this he was genuine, he said, I want to call Richard Dawkins to the University of Dundee to have a debate about evolution with Harun Yahya. What do you think? He's not a great idea. And I said, please, 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 please don't do that. He said, what do you mean? I said, you will embarrass Islam. If you do this, you will embarrass Islam. Richard Dawkins is a very good biologist. You can't take that away from him. He's a rubbish philosopher. But he's a, and he's an even worse theologian. But he's a very good scientist. And if you try to argue with him about science, he will tie you in knots. Yeah? He's an Oxford Don, for God's sake. And you want to call Harun Yahya to say, look at this fossil. Look, see, Richard Dawkins will take that fossil and give you 300 points why it proves the theory of evolution. Yeah? No. You want to refute something? You learn it. And what Ghazali did, and this was his greatness, in the whole of philosophy, did he refute philosophy? No. He refuted 20 points. He took 20 premises of philosophers, and that's what he refuted. He said, this is what's rubbish about philosophy. This is what they've got wrong. And I'm going to prove that it's wrong, not from Quran and Sunnah. I'm going to prove it's wrong with philosophy. And that's why the work is called the tahafut, the incoherence of the philosophers. Because actually what he is saying is, you're saying that the world has always existed, the, 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 the universe has always existed. But actually, if you follow your premises round, this, your, your, follow the trail of breadcrumbs, you actually find that by showing that the world has always existed, you are proving that the world has not always existed. So actually, your argument in and of itself makes no sense. It is intern, not externally wrong, it is internally wrong. You guys have misunderstood philosophy. And that's amazing. It was an amazing work. But the maqasid, the work here, the work here is, I'm not going to any judgment call, this is just what philosophers believe. That work was translated, it went throughout the Muslim world, and it was translated eventually into Latin. The, the prologue got left somewhere. And so it was just a work about, this is the philosophy of Aristotle. Okay? It was translated and it came eventually to the Christian world, and it was and it was taken up by Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas. And St. Thomas Aquinas used large parts of the Maqasid al philosopher and also Ibn Rushd's refutation of the Tahafut, on which to base his own synthesis of Christian belief and Greek philosophy. And that work is pretty much the single most important work in the development of all Western thought, the Summa Theologica and the Summa Contra Gentilis. These are the most important works in the whole of Western thought, and they were very influenced by what Ghazali had written in the Maqasid. Yeah? Because people didn't believe that an Arab scholar had written this work. People believed for hundreds of years that the Maqasid was actually written by Aristotle and simply translated into Arabic and then translated into Latin. So they mistook Ghazali's kind of, this is what Aristotle has to say, and I'm going to prove him later, and prove him wrong later. They took that and they mistook it completely for Aristotle's actual, that's how brilliant an exposition of philosophy it was. And Ghazali spent, according to his own, uh, his own admission, two years studying philosophy and one year reflecting on it. So Ghazali was in a situation where there was a huge influence. 
the Shia, the Mu'tazila, the Muslim philosophers, all influenced by Greek philosophy, and all of them, the, the religion was going this way and that way. And what he did, he went to the root. The root's philosophy, let's sort philosophy out, sorted. But what he did was incorporated a lot of what was right about philosophy into religion. And this is this very important point the Prophet ﷺ said, that al-hikmatu dalatu al-mu'min. Aynama wajad akhad, or aynama wajad wa ahakku bihi. Alright? Wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he has the more right to it, or he takes it. And what Ghazali did beautifully was synthesize. This is his great achievement. He could take things in and he could filter. This is useful, this is not. He could filter out the wheat from the chaff. And that's what he did. And he said most of what's true in philosophy is what the philosophers themselves have taken from their Sufis. From whatever ancient prophets came to them and whatever their spirit, that those people of spirituality and saints, those words that have come like about morals and stuff have, that have come forward are actually from, they are actually a form of divine dispensation. And so he took it. And that was his great achievement. But this was what was going on in the Muslim world at the time. It would not have been fun to live in the 5th century. It really would not have been fun to live in the 5th century. There were so many political currents pulling in different directions. So many intellectual currents, currents pulling in different directions. Next week, inshallah, we'll look at the Ghazali's works. We'll look at his impact on what, what was his impact. We've spoken a bit about it already, but what was his impact? Because the Muslim world was not was going through was in entropy now. It's in a state of entropy. It's just decaying and decaying and decaying politically. It's never going to pull back to the center again. You are never going to have a centralized authority again, ever, in the Muslim world. Okay? How do you maintain the religion? When the religion has been associated with the state for so long, how do you maintain the religion? You find alternative pathways. Now you find the Hadith movement. The hadith movement becomes a massive widespread movement. People like Khatib al-Baghdadi, people like Darakutni. Now, you know, this idea that you have to study the hadith, you have to study the hadith, we, you know, how we use the hadith it becomes a huge thing now. Okay? You find the Sufi tariqas, the Sufi tariqas internationalize spirituality and take Islam further, take Islam into parts of the world where it had never existed before. Southeast Asia, India and Pakistan and places like that. You know, the, the East Africa, Central Africa, and so forth. Yeah? And in that, Ghazali played a huge role in bringing things together, holding things together. Intellectually, he was the center. He held. If the center holds, then everything holds. If the center fails, things will go, are going to go in different directions. And Ghazali was that linchpin. He held things together. Because he had the capacity, not just to say, philosophy, kufr. Shiism, kufr. Anyone can say that. He didn't do that. He said, this is what they've got right. This is our right. We have the right to this. This is what they've got right. This is what they've got wrong. And because he was not just some wandering, random wandering Sufi, not just some free thinker, but because he was a great faqih, a great usuli, a great theologian, a celebrity superstar scholar, who everyone acknowledges as a great scholar, he had the, this is ethos, he had the, he had the prestige, the hishma, to be able to hold this together. And he said, this is right, because I say it's right. I'm saying it's right. And people said, you know what, Ghazali said it's right. It's okay. Okay? So he is, the mo from his time up to our time, Ghazali is the single most important influential figure in the entire history of Muslim thought. And next week we'll look at some of his works, we'll look at his effect and his influence, and then we move on to the Munqib, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair for coming. We'll leave it there. Allah bless you all for attending. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Barakum khayyar wa rahmeen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi